Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to return to Neville Goddard, and we're going to look at a lecture delivered in May of 1965 called The Law, Self-Circumcision. It's always funny when Neville uses the term circumcision. He's really talking about circumcising the heart. And it really is a discussion of going to the heart. This particular lecture talks about the law, and it's always interesting to add a little bit more knowledge that we can get about the law. I always enjoy it when Neville talks about the law. The Law, Self-Circumcision, May 28, 1965. Tonight is on the law. We are told that salvation is from the Jew, and you wonder why. Because you and I think on this level of a certain race of people, a very small minority, and salvation is from that minority. But it isn't so, not in the Bible. So we turn to other aspects of the word to see what is meant by this statement, salvation, is from the Jew. Now we'll take salvation on this level. Suppose you are embarrassed financially. Suppose you're embarrassed in a thousand different ways. Well, if you realize your objective, which is the solution of your problem, then you have been saved. As we are told, it is from the Jew. Now let us turn to the second chapter of the book of Romans. Here is one who was the greatest promoter of the Christian faith. As we know, it is written by Paul. Whoever Paul was, it is Paul. He tells us, first of all, it is not the hearers of the word who are righteous before God, but the doers of the word will be justified. Then he said, for the real Jew is not one who is outward, nor is the true circumcision external and physical. 2.28 The Jew is one who is inward, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is not a physical, external state. Now in the Old Testament, you find, remove the foreskin of your heart. You find that in the 10th chapter of Deuteronomy, remove the foreskin of your heart. The same is repeated in the 4th chapter of Jeremiah, remove the foreskin of your heart. Now, here, this is to the Jew, and from the Jew, salvation is from the Jew. Well, how can I do it? And what does it mean? Here in this room right now, this is the foreskin. Everything in my world that my senses reveal and confirm, everything that's the foreskin that hides and completely conceals the head of creation. The head of creation is I am. That's God. So I go to bed tonight in the assumption that things are not as I would like them to be. And I go to bed not circumcised, but uncircumcised. I am told to remove the foreskin. Remove it completely. From what? From my heart. Well, my heart is the center of it all. The very center, the core of my being. So what do I accept as true? The evidence of my senses when I fall asleep. Well then... I am sleeping as one who is uncircumcised. I am told to circumcise myself before God and remove the foreskin of my heart. That the real Jew is not one born after the flesh from the seed of Abraham, but one born after the faith of Abraham. So do I really believe it this night that every dream in my world is attainable? But every dream, if I would sleep unveiled, as it were, completely circumcised, removing the foreskin of my heart. Now James throws much light on it in the second chapter of the book of James. The epistle of James, he said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. For if you are a hearer and not a doer, you are like a man who looks into a mirror and sees his natural face and then turns and instantly forgets what he is like. But if you are a doer and not a forgetful hearer, then you would look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere therein. Such a man shall be blessed in his doing. I look into the perfect law. What perfect law? 
what is the mirror into which I can look this night? So I go to bed, and then I mentally see a world as I would see it were I the man that I would like to be. Now, I must not forget it. I must not look into the mirror and see that wonderful state and then turn away and become a forgetful here. I must look into it and persevere, for I can say I saw it. I am seeing it. I will continue to see it until what I am seeing is perfectly expressed. How do I do it? Very simply, it's a simple, simple statement. The lady is not here tonight. She only comes on Tuesdays. Well, here is a lady in her late 70s, only enough to live modestly, but certainly no extra funds for the normal things of life, what I would call normal. If a fix is needed, a normal thing is to put it back, to repair it. If a painting job is in order, it's normal thing to paint. Well, she couldn't afford these things, but she heard what you're going to hear tonight, that imagining creates reality, that imagination is spiritual sensation. She heard that and she said, I would explain it this way. Can I smell paint and there's no paint? Yes, I could smell paint if I want to. Could I feel the wetness of the paint? Yes, I can feel it if I want to. Could I see a change in color with the interior and exterior of my home painted as I want it? Yes, I can see that. So I could make all my senses to play upon it. I would even taste it if I wanted to. So sleeping in her home that needed repair and needed painting, she believed that she heard and having believed it, she believed it to the point of producing action on her part, not just believing it. Oh, I believe what he said. So be not just a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. If you are a doer, you'll be blessed in your act. You are a doer. So she fell asleep smelling paint. Well, if she's smelling paint, it's because her home's been painted. So she fell asleep in the end. She can smell the paint. And then she received after her persistency, for she had about three weeks of this persistency. Three weeks, that's all. Night after night, she fell asleep in a painted home. Then came a letter from Lloyd's of London. You read the story. She received a notice that she was heir to several thousand dollars, something like eight or nine thousand dollars. I can't recall the figure from one she had never seen, never seen. This lady wrote her a few years before, something like 12 or 14 years before, asking her to investigate the nature of the death of her brother who died in this country. She investigated and then wrote her findings and that was it. The correspondence ended. Three letters went across the ocean and then the lady died and left in her will to this lady. She had never seen this sum of money. So she repaired the house and painted the house and has several thousand dollars left over. She filled the bill of the true Jew. I'm quite sure were she here tonight, she would protest my statement. She would say to me, I am a Christian. Well, I would say to her, Christianity is only a fulfillment of Judaism. That's all that it is. There is only Judaism in this wonderful world. You're either the true Jew or you're not a Jew. If you are the true Jew, you will know what Christianity really is. And Christianity will unfold within you. And everything said of Christ Jesus in the Gospels, you will experience. But everything. But on this level, salvation is from the Jew. So you are either the perfect Jew or you are not. And the one who said, I am a Jew, I am of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, and here is one who persecuted Paul. But he found the story of Judaism. He found the true story behind the whole picture. The foundation in stone is Judaism. That's the core of it all. Without that, you have no Christianity. How could there be any Christian in this world? without Judaism. But people misunderstand what Judaism is. It's not external. It's not going to shul. It's not going to synagogue and performing any external act. Man must perform circumcision on himself. 
while a little boy at the age of eight days has it performed by another on him, that's an external act. I'm not denying that in some biological way it may be a very clean act. It may be the most wonderful thing hygienically. I'm not denying that. But when it comes to the spirit, that is not it. When it comes to the spirit, we perform it on ourselves. As Paul tells us in the second chapter of the book of Romans, he was born a Jew. It was performed on him as a little boy of eight days. He doesn't deny that he understood the meaning behind it and having understood if he tried to give it to us, that as we retire at night, we must perform the uncovering of the head of creation, take off, remove completely that thing that hides what we really want in this word. Read it carefully in the ancient book of Deuteronomy and read it also in Jeremiah. Read it in Ezekiel. Remove the foreskin, that's what we're told in Jeremiah told in all the ancient books, but the where from your heart removed it from our heart. Well, I go to bed tonight feeling distressed for you or for someone else or for myself. I'm feeling it that she is unwell or he is unwell or this, that, and the other. So I go to bed feeling this, that is the foreskin over my heart. Remove it and make me behold him, behold her, behold them as I would like to see them, for man becomes what he beholds. So if I would sleep in the assumption that you are as I would like you to be, and persuade myself that this imaginal act is true, well, then I am creating. I have unveiled the creative head, which is I am. That's the name of God. Exodus 3.14 I have unveiled it and put something for him to behold, something new. So we go back to James, the one who really hears and does is one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres therein. Well, what would liberate you but my vision of you? If I see you tonight as you told me that you are today, and you don't like what you are today, and that's the concept that I hold of you tonight, I am not circumcised relative to you. I am not looking into the perfect law of liberty relative to you. But if tonight I go to bed and I think of you and I see you not as reason tells me that you are, but I see you as I would like to see you and I know you would like to see yourself and have the whole world see you, if I would go to bed that way, then I certainly perform the act of removing the foreskin of my heart relative to you. Having done that, I put something in its place. What? The law of liberty. I looked into the law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, and liberated you. Well, does it work? Did the little lady get her home? From a total stranger, she got the money. I could tell you unnumbered stories, hundreds and hundreds of similar stories. You don't have to know anyone who has money. You don't have to wait for some relative to die who may leave you in her will. You don't need anything in this world other than to know the art of self-circumcision. That is part of scripture. Now here is a simple little story and how it's been misread over the ages. We read in the book of Exodus, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk, 2319. Now here is a simple statement, but the Bible is a mystery and man takes it on a certain level and completely confuses the entire picture. In this year, 1965, in every Orthodox home or Orthodox restaurant of the Hebraic faith. You couldn't go into a home and expect to be served a dairy product with a meat product. It just isn't done. A young bride receives as a gift two sets of dishes, one for meat, one for dairy things. You go into a kosher restaurant. You wouldn't ask for butter if you order, say, a meat sandwich. If you ordered some other kind of sandwich, yes, they'll put butter on it for you. They have butter but they would not put butter on any meat sandwich or serve butter on any dairy product when you order meat. Going back to this statement, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. That hasn't a thing to do with dietary law. It has to do with what Paul, the great Jew, is talking about. Tonight, I decide to sacrifice my concept of you. That is not what I want of you in this world. That's the kid. It's my concept. Therefore, I am the mother of that concept. Whether you told it to me or not, my acceptance 
of your concept of yourself. I simply give birth to it. It's my kid. But I don't like that concept of you. I would like you to be, and I name the most glorious thing concerning you. Therefore, I'm going to sacrifice my concept of you. That's the kid. Now, I must not n now turn back and give my attention to that from which I divorced my attention. I must not boil the kid in its mother's milk. So if tonight I think of you as I wouldn't like to see you, I am boiling you in the mother's milk, for my attention is the milk that keeps alive that state that I would like to sacrifice. So I turn my attention from the concept that I hold of you. I must give it 100% to the concept that I would like to hold of you. And if my premise is true, as the scripture teaches, that imagining creates reality, you may say to me, where does that appear in scripture that imagining creates reality? I'll turn you to the 11th chapter, the 24th verse of the book of Mark. Now, these aren't the words, but you tell me if it doesn't actually mean it. These are the words put into the mouth of the awakened God in man. For when God awakes, where would he awake but in man? He is in man. He's buried in man. So the one in whom he awoke discovered this and revealed it to us. And these are the words. Whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe you have received it, and you will. Well, is that not put down into essence that imagining creates reality? If I am called upon to believe that I have received what I desire, do I not imagine that I have it? Do I imagine that you are what I want you to be? And if I'm told in this statement that if I do so, I will get it, well, doesn't imagining create reality? Well, isn't that scripture? That's what I'm told in scripture. That's how I read scripture. So I say to everyone, try it. It costs you nothing. All you can do is simply try it. If it proves itself in performance, does it really matter what the world thinks? If this very night, this room actually became crowded with the most learned people in the world, and they challenged my right to say that, and you rose and told them case histories concerning your use of the law, would it really matter how wise they seem to be in the eyes of the world? Now here in the end of the statement of Paul, in the second chapter of Romans, he makes a play on the word. He tells us who the real Jew is, the one who lives inwardly, the synagogue, not one who goes day after day at the death of his father to prove that he is actually keeping alive a certain law. Nothing external at all, but one who inwardly leads this life by circumcising himself, and he circumcises not outwardly, he circumcises the heart, his feelings. He takes off that which veils what he wants to see, takes off the veil completely, and sees what he wants to see. Now he makes this statement at the end of this passage. His praise is not from men, but from God. Now the word praise is Judah or Jew. The word Judah means praise. The word Jew means praise. It's a play on the word. And I warn you, he uses the word mystery 18 times in his letters. So his praise is not from men, but from God. We are told if we read scripture correctly in the book of Samuel that the Lord sees not as man sees. Man sees the outward appearance and the Lord sees the heart, only the heart. So when the huge giant of a man stood before Samuel, Samuel thought, surely he is the Lord's choice. And the Lord said, no, I reject him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man sees after the outward appearance of things, but the Lord sees the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. So here, the words, his praise was not from men, but from God. Romans 2, 29. And the word praise means Judah or the Jew. Therefore, his Jewishness, his real Jewishness was not from the praise of men, not for what men would say, but what God saw in him. So men today give anything to have another medal and to have another honor. And all these things before men, you read every morning's paper, honors today to do so and so. There are certain people in our city. They get them every day where they put them, I don't know, and just love them. 
All of that is on the outside. They are not the true Jew. Everyone in this world must become the true Jew. But the real true Jew and the true Jew lives inwardly. I don't care what the world will tell you. I was born and raised in a Christian family. I knew nothing outside of Christianity. But I didn't realize what it was until I began to awaken to discover that Christianity is only the fulfillment of Judaism. That's all that it is. The great revelation is Judaism all in the Old Testament, and the new interprets the old, not the other way around. All of a sudden you come upon it. And who did the interpretation? The Jew did. You're taught to believe that others did? No. Go back and read the story. Paul did with his grand claim, I am a Jew. Take the story of the central figure, Jesus Christ. Is there any denial in scripture that he is a Jew? He is the Jew of Jews, who simply began to awake within himself, and all the promises made to Abraham he fulfilled within himself. He doesn't deny that he was the Jew. So the real Jew is the one who lives inwardly. No one who will claim by reason of his physical birth that he's a Jew. It's my hope that he'll become a Jew. He may be a Jew physically in his own mind's eye, but if he knows scripture, I say to him, you must become a Jew. You become a Jew only as you begin to live inwardly and realize the whole drama of life is taking place within you. It's not on the outside. That's the true Jew. But the one who will think that because of the accident of birth, he's a Jew as the Christian thinks by the accident of birth that he is a Christian. One billion Christians walk the earth and think they are Christians because of the mere accident of their physical birth. And they aren't Christians at all because Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. He must first become a Jew, and the Jew is to live inwardly. Then man discovers the drama of life is mental. It isn't physical at all. So when man discovers that, it doesn't matter what the problem is. You are intelligent enough to know if this is the problem, what would be the solution? Ask a very simple question. What would be the solution of this problem? Well, you could see it mentally, couldn't you? Well, then you could circumcise yourself. You take off the problem and see the solution. Bring every sense of your body to bear upon that solution. The little lady brought the sense of smell. That was the dominant smell. She could smell paint, and she knew the whole thing must have been done prior to the application of paint. And she knew she could see the color that she wanted. She brought two senses. She can bring all your senses to bear upon this unveiled state. And then cover yourself once more with this state. And that's why Paul said, I die daily what man in this world thinks of dying daily. He died daily. He said, I die every day. If I die every day, then I circumcise myself every day. For the head of creation is covered every day with what I believe to be true. So every night he uncovers himself and he removes this foreskin from his heart and removing it from his heart every night. He created every night a new world. He said, I die every day. 1 Corinthians 15.31 Here is Paul, the greatest of all Christians, one who said, I am of the seed of Abraham and the tribe of Benjamin. And here I stand condemned by my own people because they don't understand the great mystery of Judaism. So I say to everyone, everyone must become the Jew, the real Jew, the living Jew that walks this earth knowing that the whole drama is taking place within oneself, not on the outside at all. When you do that, well, then does it really matter what the world will say? May I tell you, they'll only say what you are saying. I've been teaching this since the 30s. This is now the 60s. I'm going back into the 30s when I started. And when I started, because I was completely unknown and unsafe in my foundation when I would speak in New York City to audiences of around a thousand or more, I always would have those who would challenge me in the audience because within me I was challenging myself. Ministers would come, rabbis would come, priests would come, and they would simply throw the book at me. 
Well, I was a young boy then, 30 years ago. You take 30 years from me, I was still a young fella. And so I felt unsafe or insecure. And they would throw it. But as things began to unfold within me, and I proved this principle, and I was speaking no longer from theory, but from experience, they didn't come. No one challenged me. All those opposing with opposition were still, because they were still in me. When I stand before you and tell you that Jesus Christ is real in you, but he's asleep in you, and he will awaken in you, and when I tell you what I know from experience, that the day will come and you will awaken within your own skull, and everything that is said in scripture concerning Jesus Christ, you're going to experience. And you will be born in the same miraculous supernatural manner. You will find David a biblical fame and he has called you father. As he called Jesus Christ father. As I had this, not argument, a little wonderful dinner in Barbados last year. And this very wonderful minister of the Episcopal faith. And I was telling him my experience. I said, yes. This explosion in my brain and suddenly standing before me is David of biblical fame and David calls me my father. He said to me, knowing his Bible backwards, he said, but David did not call him my father, he called him my Lord. I said, yes, but the word is Adonai and Adonai is a term used by every son of his father, for every servant of his master, of every slave, of his owner, of every citizen of the emperor, but every son calls his father Adonai, my Lord. So as he said, if David in spirit calls him my Lord, how then can I be David's son? Matthew twenty-two forty-two. I am David's father, is what he's implying. Then you will know who you really are, for David is the son of God in the second psalm. Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Verse 7. Here is his only begotten son, it's David, and the whole vast world thinks it's another and it's another. It's David. The David that you read of in the Old Testament, that's the David set up in eternity so that everyone will reach that moment in the unfolding tree of life when David will appear and bear witness to who you are because you are that tree and that tree is God himself. Only David can reveal to you who you are and David calls you my father. So when David calls you my father, you know who you are. It takes the son to reveal the father and all the priesthoods of the world can tell you what they want. I am telling you what I have experienced. Scripture supports it. It is all in scripture, Matthew eleven twenty seven. Everyone will grow upon this tree, this tree of life and reach that moment in time when that lovely bud will appear into flower and it's David, that beautiful, wonderful, you can't describe the beauty of David and he reveals you as God, the Father, yet you are still clothed in the weakness of flesh and remain clothed until you finish your story and then you take off the garment. Then you are one with the being who conceived it all for his infinite purpose. So tonight, take it on this level. Take it on this level, and when you retire this night, practice. If you don't succeed tomorrow, practice anyway. Practice the art of this self-circumcision, the removing of the foreskin of the heart. Practice. If you do, you'll get results. So you can take it not only for yourself, take it for another, but it's all performed upon yourself. As you are told, circumcise yourself to God. Remove the foreskin of your heart. Well, how do I do it? So we remove it by thinking of someone not as they seem to be, unless it's a pleasant thing, but as they ought to be. When you see them as they ought to be and you fall asleep in that vision as though it were true, then it comes to pass. Now bear in mind, the word of God is always good news. So we are told here the word of God. It's never bad news. I bring you glad things. I bring you good news. I hear something horrible of someone else. Don't believe it. That is simply the foreskin to be removed. The good news is all that you hear. So whatever you want to be or you want a friend to be, that's good news. Now, if you don't hear that or don't believe it, 
then cut off whatever you don't believe by turning your attention from it. You turn your attention away from it and see only what you want to see, and you are seeing and hearing good news. Now you can apply this and use the medium of hearing. Listen as though you heard good news from some friend. Listen to his voice and actually believe in the reality of that imaginal voice and persuade yourself of the reality of that voice. And listen, it's removing the foreskin of the heart as something else impresses this wonderful creative power that is your own wonderful human imagination, which is I am, and that is God. God became man that man may become God. So every child born of woman has God buried in him, or he couldn't even breathe, for God is the breath of life, couldn't even breathe. So that little child, having dreamed that he's God, now explained to him the great mystery as revealed in Scripture, how God so loved man, he became man, that man by his sacrifice, that is God's sacrifice, may become God. And then, when it begins to unfold within you, I can't tell anyone the thrill I can't tell anyone the personal thrill I can share with you in words, but how could I persuade you to the point where you could feel what I feel in the event itself? I can't. I describe it to the best of my ability and tell you all these wonderful things that happen within, that everything from Genesis to Revelation is all true on levels and levels and levels. You will reach the level where all the promises begin to unfold and every promise made to Abraham becomes true. Every promise, it's all there. So I say to everyone tonight, when you go to bed, think of a friend who will rejoice in your good fortune. Now you say, well, I'm not fortunate today. All right. Who would rejoice? Were you fortunate today? Bring him before your mind's eye and let him see you as he would see you were it true. That's all that you do. And just simply look just as though it were true and fall asleep in that assumption. At that very moment, you took off the foreskin of the heart of this day and exposed the head of creation. And the head of creation will create what it beholds in a way that no one knows this creative act of yours will lead you across some bridge of incidents from where you were at that moment of assuming it to the fulfillment of that assumption. It will. Just try it. Before you judge it, just try it. When you try it, and I promise you, it will prove itself in performance. Well then, it will not matter from then on what others say. It doesn't really matter. Then you'll see what religion really is in this world. May I tell you the greatest book in the world is the Bible. You won't outgrow it. You'll outgrow every modern book today on science. In fact, they're going so quickly that you can't print it before it becomes obsolete. There isn't a scientific book today coming off the press that is not already. I wouldn't say disproved, but it is passé. Something else is coming in to explain, to prove. That's not it at all but you aren't going to outgrow the Bible. The Bible is the book of books. It's the word of God, and it proves itself in a way that few people in this world realize. But oh, the thrill when the thing begins to unfold within you and all these things become true. You can hardly believe this great mystery. I was thrilled this past week reading Ben Gurion, who is the former premier of Israel, and I was thrilled when he spoke of the Bible, asking all to come back to Israel and study this tongue that they may really understand the Bible. To see a man who was the head of his country so in love with the book of books, I must confess I was thrilled beyond measure to read it, that he was so completely carried away at his advanced age in the love of this book. I'll tell you the real Jew of the world is the one who is not one outwardly, who is one inwardly, who will practice what I have asked you this night to practice. You practice it and you will know 
that salvation truly is from the Jew. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence, as we will do now, and there are a few questions afterwards. Now, let us go into the silence. first question is inaudible. Neville answers, the question is, what is the meaning of heart? Heart is the core. The very center of one's being is feeling. That is the core of being. And so unveil that state. It's not the physical organ any more than the physical organ the world would think of as circumcision. These are only symbols they are not really the true reality. So I don't cut my physical heart any more than I would the physical organ, which seems to be the cause of creation. We know it's not the cause. It's the instrument, but it's not the cause of creation. But here we speak of the heart, the core, the center of one's feeling. Well, really in Hebrew, the heart and mind are the same, you know. They are almost used in translation interchangeably. So the depth of my mind, the very core of my mind, what I really believe concerning anything in this world, and conceal what I really believe. But what I really believe, I live with, so that's the heart. Question, what did the minister say when you told him that? Answer, what did the minister say when I told him that? Well, first of all, he was a gentleman, and whether he was convinced or not, I do not know. He was a perfectly wonderful chap a very prominent minister in the Episcopal Church, and we had dinner together at the hotel with my son Larry. He and his wife, she was English, of the Caucasian race, and then we had another minister. He was of another faith, and this other couple. So we had dinner at the hotel with my son Larry. I was simply explaining to these two ministers that I was directing my attention to the minister who was by far the more intelligent and the brilliant one of the evening, the one minister well, he was just having a little job as far as I'm concerned. But the other minister was an intelligent, wonderful gentleman, a cultured gentleman. And I was just directing my attention to him, giving him my experience based purely upon experience. I said, he called me my father and there was no uncertainty in the relationship. So we drove home together. It was another 15 mile drive. And when I got out of the car and thanked him because he took me home to my hotel, I said, you know, every word I told you this night is true. He said to me, I believe it, but we left Barbados before we got together again. So I don't know. 
but he was so much a culture gentleman, I don't know if he believed it or not. So that was my experience at this dinner party. It was a perfectly marvelous dinner party. Question. If you're demonstrating something, how do you know what you are demonstrating is the best thing for you, even though you want it? Neville answers, how do you know what you're demonstrating is the best thing for you? Well, my dear, I don't really care whether it's the best or not. If I want it today and getting it tomorrow, I discover I don't want it, then give it away. I've done that with a suit, with a hat, with a pair of shoes. I thought I must have them, so I got them, and then I wondered what possessed me when I thought of I wanted them. I gave it away, so it is the joy of getting them and may I tell you the equal joy in giving them away. Those who received them from me thought, oh, isn't it marvelous? They were thrilled to receive a suit I'd only worn once. And yet, when I saw myself in the mirror having put that suit on, I picked out that material, and it was not something that came in enormous bolts. I go to my tailor. He's been my tailor for almost 30 years now. And Louis brings out this bolt and says, Neville, I think this is just what you need. He knows exactly my taste and he persuades me I get the suit and then I go home and my wife says Neville what possessed you why a thing like that I wouldn't be seen on the street with you so I gave it to someone else who loved it so maybe he was praying he didn't have the money to buy it I had the money to buy it and he got it through me so who knows how this thing jumps we've got bridges of incidents and we move across these bridges towards fulfillment and we think that is the end we are only the intermediary he was the end he was praying so the one who prayed for a suit he prayed for it and i was the medium through which he got it i've seen that work time and again so don't be distressed if you buy a hat and you wouldn't be seen at a dog fight really someone else would love it and go to a wedding with it just love it so that's part of the whole grand wonderful plan so get it and who wants to be in the same place forever who wants to wear the same suit forever who wants anything forever these are all garments that you put on and take off when someone says now this is really it i'm going to stay here and suddenly a 30-story building goes up right next to you and you can't see anything you're living in a dungeon four years ago we moved where we are now We've been there for four and a half years. There wasn't a tall building in the area. Come see where I live now. There are 30 story buildings, 16 story buildings, all kinds of buildings and more and more it gets more and more dark. And so who wants to be there forever? In a little while, they're going to rezone where we live. We really have to push the houses out, rezoned it, and then you'll be left alone in a small little place and nothing but commercial buildings around it. So don't be wedded to anything here. You're wedded to one being, and that being is God. And he'll take you through from place to place until finally you awake and you are he. All is yours anyway, after you awake. Question. When do we know when we're judging and when we're comparing? Answer. When we are judging and when we are comparing? Well, if I understand the question, sir, well, would you give me an example? Question. The statement, judge not lest ye be judged, but at times we compare rather than judge. How do we know when we are comparing and not judging? Well, it's a very good question. You heard it, didn't you? Judge not lest ye be judged. Well, first of all, we're told any judgment you pronounce, it's because it's within you. Now, I wouldn't judge someone if someone comes before me and they say, well, now I did so and so, or this is what I did. I wouldn't tell them because you were lax in the past. That's why you need today. I would say to anyone, what do you want? I am taught to believe, forgive everyone. I don't care what he has done, forgive me. Well, I can't forgive him by just saying that I did. All right, that's not forgiveness in my concept. If I really know how to forgive, I would say, so you did so and so and what would you like in place of what you did what is your desire if i can persuade myself of the reality of his desire instead of what seems to be the fact i'll put that in the place and then i don't judge him because i look upon it as states an infinite number of states that you 
and I are in a state tonight. Every child in this world is in a state. Now the man who would judge is in a good state and the one who I would judge is in an evil state. I should not condemn the one in the evil state. It's the state. I should go out to create a state to deliver the one from that evil state, not to judge him because he's only in a state. So if I put everyone in this world in a state, I will say to anyone, what would you want? When he names it, he's telling me he doesn't want to remain in that state. So I'm called upon to create a state to deliver him from that state. So when I bring him out, he was never really that. He was only in a state. I put him into another state. So if I look upon the whole vast world as simply states into which you and I, living beings, fall either unwittingly or wittingly into states, well, then I can go forward and deliver people by creating states to deliver them. Therefore, I'm not judging people. I just leave them as they are and let others judge them if they will. But I don't judge them. I just simply take them and deliver them from a certain state. Now, I must then be the judge as to what they want. They may not want it more than 24 hours after they get it, but let them be the judge. Lift them into another state. So if I distinguish between individuals and the states they occupy, I'm on safe ground. Man can create states to deliver others from these so-called unwelcome states. Question, does this refer to the subjective part of man or the objective mental state of man pertaining to his senses? Answer, well, if I may use the term and I think the world accepts it, the whole world could be done subjectively. Confirmation of that work would be objective. And so I must bring it into an objective state to bear witness to the reality of the creativity of my imaginal states. If I believe in the reality of an imaginal state, it should have confirmation. So it takes time between planting a seed and growing the tree or growing the fruit. So I imagine a state. That's the planting of a certain seed. Well, now, there's an interval of time between the planting and the reaping. The reaping would be objective. The planting is subjective. Until Tuesday and Tuesday's subject is your future. If you want one passage from the Bible, which is only one small part of what I will use, take the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. And that is the end of the law, self-circumcision. Such a funny title. And I laugh a little bit whenever Neville refers to the head coming out. It almost is humorous on his part. Uh, there's a lightness to it. But the idea is there is a part of us that is covered up. There's a part of us that is divine, but covered up. And if we can release that part and awaken it, then we are in conjunction with the law that Neville is talking about. The story here is wonderful. I love the story of the woman that smells the paint. Now, the bridge of incidents that occurs in her case comes from decades ago. The time loop involved in the bridge of incidents that occurs is always wonderful to talk about. She continuously smelled the paint, could feel the touch of the paint, and would go to sleep in that state. And then all of a sudden she has $10,000. So the law always works. And what you're praying now, may you may go back in time and events are already working out for things you haven't even prayed for. Think about that. You may pray tomorrow for something and events have been going on for years and years to give you what you want. That is an amazing concept and idea. So it's interesting the way he talks about the word Jew in the Bible and that is not a race. Oftentimes people say, you know, from the Bible, that the Jews are the promised ones. And he's saying here that Jew is just being inward. The true Jew lives inwardly. So I'd love to get your impressions of this. It's a little bit different. And what you think, uh, obviously a lot of this is repetitious. 
We've gone over hundreds of lectures now and each one is good and the repetition helps. He will cover these subjects in different ways. So tonight, go to bed and peel off the skin of your heart and let the head come out. And imagine what it is you want. Feel it. Smell it. For smell is something that Neville hasn't referred to as often. But smell it. Feel it. Use your senses as if it's happening in this moment. And a bridge of incidents will occur to bring you to that moment. Don't give up. Anything is possible. This law always works. Test it. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.